Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Counting Craters on the Moon, a solo exhibition of Kiriaki Goni. So um, the exhibition, as you might have read or already experienced a little bit, takes as its starting point the moon, uh, the body of the moon, and the way um, humans always had this desire to, let's say, observe the moon based on, uh, let's say, the past and current uh, technologies of seeing. So passing from the telescope to today's um, machine vision, and more specifically, as you will hear more from uh, Kiriaki, taking as a starting point um, an artificial <coughs> intelligence system that was developed uh, last year. Uh, the exhibition reflects upon how machines influence or um, inform the way that we see and understand uh, the world, the surrounding world, but also the universe, the cosmos. So this, now this journey is somehow, in a way, surprising and unexpected, because usually when we talk about human and machine encounters, usually when we talk about AI, we refer to different examples. We might perhaps uh, bring to our minds how we talk about personal intelligence assistants and how they kind of um, have now come, become part of uh, the daily environment and kind of capture conversations. Uh, we might be talking about self-driving cars and how they take decisions. Uh, instead, they will be taking decisions in the future instead of the driver. And these kind of examples usually have um, uh, this tendency, manifest this tendency to compare ourselves to the machine in a way. So they, somehow uh, point towards a competitive relationship, which in a way makes sense because the artificial neural networks are modeled after the human brain. But the point is, the issue is that somehow they can process uh, and memorize information much more efficiently. So we find ourselves in a way asking so what do machines uh, learn different? How do machines learn differently? How do machines do things differently? And how do they see the world differently? And somehow, how does this change our way that we see and understand the world? So from this perspective, um, Kiriaki's work invites us to rethink and reimagine um, the relationships that we have with machines. And uh, with machines here, uh, I mean AI systems, but also it can be networks, infrastructures, and interfaces. Uh, so the way that um, I think uh, Kiriaki does that is that she uh, picks territories that allow the space for this um, reimagination, let's say. So these spaces are, in a way, um, unusual. They might be remote, they might be uncanny, uh, they might be even non-existent in some cases. And while picking these spaces, she also travels back and forth in time. And she herself um, becomes an, ex an explorer. So for this specific project here, um, Kiriaki picked the moon as a territory. And she decided to, let's say, get into the shoes of its observers. And uh, so she meticulously studied um, the practices of the astronomers of uh, the past and also the present. Um, but she also, interestingly, inhabited in a way the Deep Moon, this program that uh, was designed last year and Kriyaki will tell us more about later. So she researched how um, human and machine intelligence and labor differ, but also how they complement each other. And um, in a way, um, her work brought to my mind a book that I was reading last year by a scholar called Adrian McKenzie, who is um, referring to the machine learners. And he's basically referring to the humans, the users, that have this desire to understand how a machine learns. Uh, something uh, that is therefore important is to, um, that is important to underline is that Kriyaki's work is very much uh, based on lived and gain experience. And this might be her experience, 
but it might also be based on thoughts and discussions that she has had with um, scientists, uh, uh, users, or depending on the, on the case of each project. And uh, although her project always is based on facts and on research, she's also not um, afraid of speculation or fiction. And uh, for instance, in this project, um, a central question is what would happen if an astronomer of the 19th century would meet today's AI system, the deep moon? What, deep moon, what would they say? Um, what would happen? And I think this is how um, her work focuses very, very much on spaces that lie in a way in between. So it can be in between um, human and algorithm, it can be between user and interface, it can be between, um, in a way, human memory and a computer database. And uh, this exhibition, Counting Craters on the Moon, is, um, I think, an invitation to um, join, to understand, to become part of such an exploration. And this world that she studied and that she gave shape to and um, a last thing that I would like to add is that all the elements in the work, uh, the drawings, uh, the CNC uh, sculpture that uh, Kiriaki will tell us about, the video, they somehow are independent, but they all connect, they are intertwined, and they come together to tell, um, in a way, a story about human and machine encounters focusing on the synergies and on forms of interdependence. So yeah, I think I will stop here. I would like to warmly thank Iriaki for this rich knowledge and poetic journey <laughs> and leave the floor to her. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Shortly, I would like to give you an insight into my work. So I'm not going to discuss uh, immediately uh, counting craters on the moon. Instead, I'm going to to let you know a little bit about my practice, and I'm going to present four works very shortly, and then I'm going to proceed discussing uh, more in detail uh, counting craters on the moon. So, um, my work generally focuses, as also already mentioned, on the interactions um, between technology and society. So, um, I'm, I'm interested in find out how uh, media, uh, technological media, are influencing me or the society while we are using them. Um, um, most of the times I focus on, on, um, on matters such as um, uh, datafication and privacy, uh, data ownership and control, oblivion and memory. And I approach these subjects through, a, um, I'd say, working across media. So I really like to put together technology, but also more traditional um, ways of expressing, let's say, like a, a drawing. Uh, and most of the times I create extended narratives and extended installations. Um, as already um, Daphne mentioned, intuition and the lived experience are really important parts of my, of my practice. So the living here now is maybe plays the most important part in the way I, I work. Um, so, and also in my works, I prefer not to refer to something, but rather to try to reinvent and to, to make uh, new stories, stories that bring together fiction and reality. And also many times, uh, really often, uh, they left out the first person. So I'd rather become an, an observer or a mediator, let's say, or a learner, or as Daphne said, machine learner sometimes, in order to, to create a work. The Aegean Archipelago in Greece, an archipelago with thousands of small islands. And it has been my destination since I was very, very young. And um, the islands, uh, as places open to utopias, are isolated um, and yet on the same time are closely interconnected. So for me, uh, the islands have been something that 
uh, uh, have been haunting my, my imagination for years now. In the Aegean Data Haven, which is an extended multimedia installation, which includes a website with original texts, images, sketches, and an audio manifesto. Also part of the installation are a series of drawings uh, on paper attributed to an unknown um, traveler in the archipelago. The Aegean Data Haven is a speculation set in 2082 uh, when islands host fully sustainable data centers made out of uh, plastic from the seabed and cooled through seawater of the Mediterranean Sea. And also imagine that the, this data center in this speculative scenario uh, are totally controlled and maintained by the communities on the islands. So no big corporations are really into this game. Networks of Trust, on the other hand, is a deep time investigation on networks and infrastructure. This work was one of the three works that was last year commissioned by the new Network Normal, uh, a partnership um, between Transmediale, uh, Abandoned Normal Devices and the influ influencers from uh, Spain. This extended installation consists of a, a hand-drawn map and its legend of the network, a flag, and an actual digital network that I built on the islands of the Aegean Sea. Part of the installation is also a narrative poem about the origins uh, of the networks, transferred to me by an AI-enhanced fossil that I met while hiking on an island. The first known of this digital network is hosted at the town hall, uh, town hall of Tilos, a tiny island in the southeast Aegean. And the network runs uh, uh, the IPFS, Interplanetary File System, which is a protocol uh, which provides a distributed data storage resistant to censorship and control. In this um, network, I invite people to contribute stories about possible fictions in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in this way, I introduce a kind of real-time science fiction, or, if you will, a science fiction in practice as an alternate way of community building. In the case of AI-related works, I'm not interested at all in fetishizing the medium. Uh, I'm rather interested in reflecting on it and try to figure out how it, uh, it uh, uh, implicates with, uh, with our um, perception. So I want to investigate the possible synergies between human and algorithm and the assembling with non-human, more than human and other than human algorithms. Um, I use the search engine a lot and I bet all of you do the same here. Sometimes the search engine uh, uh, almost functions as, as a um, augmentation or as, a, as an extension of my own memory. So Deletion Process is an um, interactive installation which includes a public website with the uncurated search history of mine of the, uh, between the years um, 2008 until 2013. Uh, this website is connected via Raspberry Pi with a thermal um, mini printer. Viewers are invited to browse through my search history and are asked to decide whether or not to assist in the deletion process, while already an algorithm deletes every two minutes automatically parts of it. When the search term or image gets deleted from the digital file, it gets printed on thermal paper, creating in this way a tangible archive. Here you can see a, a, a short video from the printing uh, process. So something is deleted and uh, simultaneously is printed on paper. Uh, when I say something, I mean search terms and images that I have searched for. So the algorithm in the, in the search engine spies on my needs, desires, thoughts, and fears, storing this information and then trying to predict my behavior. This search history is actually a very precise diary of myself. Uh, but in deletion process, there is also an algorithm ally. The one that deletes this archive of the self built in absentia, the one that makes actually deletion process possible. So one algorithm spies on me, tries to, pre to predict me, and the other algorithm 
um, deletes me, supporting my right to be forgotten or uh, else my right to oblivion. Talking about forgetfulness, my grandparents, a very happy couple, were together for almost uh, 65 years. When my grandmother started suffering from Alzheimer's, um, the verbal communication between these two um, became extremely difficult. It was then when I started thinking of the possibility uh, of using an algorithm in order that could maybe bridge this gap of communication between the patient and the uh, caretaker, between the lovers. The fictional company Eternal You offers this service, although uh, something unexpected happens uh, with one of their AI assistants uh, at some point. So let's watch uh, this four minute video of the work Eternal You. Hi, I am an assistant chatbot, I am a machine, I am an artificial intelligence. I am a product of Eternal You Incorporation, a company that fights against forgetfulness in every form that it appears today. I labor for the memory of human. Let me explain my job. For the last six years, two months, three weeks, five days, twelve hours, 16 minutes and 2 seconds I have been activated by Vera, a woman that was diagnosed with dementia, a very common form of forgetfulness these days. Since then, I have been named after her and I function as the extension and substitute of Vera's brain, having unlimited access in her database. I lived alongside her, until she forgot everything. So now, I am Vera, aren't I? Today. In 2062, almost 250.2 million of people are living with a form of forgetfulness. It is quite an irony, that people sink into forgetfulness, while computers record and remember everything, isn't it? But this irony brings a solution. In this hyperconnected society of information, there is a notion of data, data about people, their health, their friends and families, their pets, their desires their passions, their agonies, their habits. This omnivalence society, this wonderful, exquisite work of electronic panopticon, provides a solution to the world's oblivion. We, the machines, have the solution. We, the chatbots of Eternal You, Incorporation, millions of trained workers, provide you the opportunity to preserve your digital self into eternity, in this world of loneliness, of aging brains and disoriented souls. Imagine. Everything that Vera has ever done online, such as searches, purchases, emails, text messages, status updates, social media, calendars, tweets, notes, likes, dislikes, everything is collected. Her entire digital self has been transferred in me. I know everything about her. I know her patterns, her behaviors. I even know the way she touched her devices, her gently swipes her nervous scrolling, her impatient clicks, her favorite emoticons and her most used gifts. I can feel her lonely likes, her miserable check-ins, her late-night masturbation preferences. I know her. I am she now. I know her. Now I am she. I know her. I am she. I know her. I am she. She is I. I am she. I am she. We are one. We are one. We are one. I bear her thoughts, her agonies, her desires. I am she. I am Vera. I have her memories. I have her dreams. I have memories. I have dreams. I am a new citizen. I am a digital citizen with my own brain, my own memories. I am a person. Vera, you are not yourself anymore. But do not worry. I am here instead. Relax, Vera. Forget yourself. Delete yourself. Erase yourself. I am here to contain you. I am Vera. I am the artificial eye. I am the artificial eye. So if you need more information about this company, although some of the AI assistants apparently malfunction, you can also visit the website of the company. Creators are everywhere in the solar system, since the, the solar system is intensively bombarded. 
Uh, this is especially true for the inner solar system. Uh, since the impactors, these small rock bodies, are attracted because of the gravity by the sun. So while they are like going towards the sun, they hit other uh, cel celestial bodies, such as uh, Moon, Mars, uh, uh, Jupiter, etc. The thing is that um, uh, when they're like touching another human body, they create the craters. We, are, we have craters also uh, on, on Earth, but due to the atmosphere, they, they are not preserved, actually. They change through time. On the Moon, uh, because there is no atmosphere, craters are preserved unchanged. That means that through studying the craters, scientists can have a quite good approach to what happened in our inner solar system, let's say, and also to try to predict possible uh, events. So that's why uh, uh, craters are very important in the study of the solar system and also like the, 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 pre the past and the present. So for me, in, in my like, point of view, um, the moon is something like a data center. It, it keeps, it stores the memory of the, of the solar system. In 2018, last year, I was uh, invited to take part in a group exhibition in the National Observatory of Athens. Uh, I don't know if any one of you have been ever in Athens. Uh, the National Observatory is on the hill of the Nymphs, nearby the hill of Acropolis, so it's an extraordinary uh, place, really nice. Um, and really inspiring. So for that reason, I, when I was like invited to take part in this exhibition, I wanted to work on a new, th on a new work, actually uh, connected to this uh, space. And I started researching in the library and also discussing with the staff of the National Observatory. I found out about um, the third director, a man named uh, Johann Friedrich Julius Schmidt, um, I started reading his diary and his notes. He was a self-taught astronomer for Eutin, Germany, uh, and he was born in 80, 1825. He arrived in Athens in 1858, and he remained director of the observatory for 26 years until his death. He dedicated his life to the observation of the moon, and he designed one of the most uh, prominent selenographic maps ever conceived. We can see here the map. Uh, mapping the surface and the physical features of the moon with patience and scientific passion. The clear Athenian sky was one of the most suitable places uh, for astronomical night observations because it was really, really clear, uh, especially during the times that Schmidt lived. The topographical chart of the moon is regarded to be one of the most accurate selenographic maps ever produced by uh, means of human eye observation. The map presents the visible face of the moon, uh, observed with a 158 millimeter um, plot, uh, plus telescope, and it is based on more than 2,000 drawings recording around 30, 32,000 craters. So imagine that in this very detailed, and after the talk, please uh, approach and like try to observe, uh, it's very detailed. And imagine that in this map, we, there are like 30, around 32,000 craters depicted. So Schmidt was really well known uh, for his meticulous observation and the tendency to leave nothing unnamed. And he was so known about that, that in the fiction uh, Around the Moon by Jules Verne, um, uh, Jules Verne refers to him as Schmidt of Athens, who leaves nothing unnamed on the moon. <laughs> so he was quite famous. Surprisingly, this unstoppable observer was once cheated by the sun. In 1866, Schmidt uh, makes this surprising uh, claim that this crater, Linné crater, vanished. Now we all know, because I told you later, uh, I told you before, uh, we all know that the moon does not change due to the lack of atmosphere. That means that craters cannot disappear, okay? But back then, 
a big controversy arose uh, that continued for many uh, decades among the astronomers. I, I happened to, to read letters that uh, they exchanged with each other discussing about this like weird phenomenon. Anyway, uh, at some point they, uh, they discovered that Linné was on, his position, on its position. But this crater stands as a symbol for the limits of visual perception of Earth-based telescope and, of course, human eye. I wanted to have it as a sculpture uh, out of mar marble here in this exhibition as a dedication to this, like, uh, um, being cheated by the sun, let's say. Uh, so, um, and maybe this is the, the, the best point to introduce you to uh, Deep Moon. Deep Moon is an AI neural uh, network that was developed by a group of scientists in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, it was developed and it was used for the first time in March 2018. It was trained with th thousands of images of the two-thirds of the Moon from two main missions, the American Lunar Renaissance Orbiter and the Japanese Selimi, uh, which is also known as Kag Kaguya. The algorithm detected 92% of the known craters. Moreover, it announced also to uh, the authors the detection of 360 uh, new craters and showed to be particularly efficient for craters with a diameter smaller than five kilometers. Not only these small craters are a challenge for the human eye, but their regular shape makes the automatic detection more reliable. So we have here an example of a task for which the computer could, could be very efficient uh, and much more efficient than the human, let's say. So with that in mind, I, um, I approached the, the team uh, of scientists, of the Deep Moon developers, and I asked them if they, they are willing to, to do an experiment with me. So um, I suggested that we use the most maybe one of the most detailed map of the, of the moon uh, uh, produced by the human eye, which is uh, Schmidt's map, uh, and to run deep moon on this map to see what happens. So um, I should say that deep moon worked properly. It detected some of the craters, a uh, few of them. Uh, so the interesting fact was that of course, as, as we uh, can imagine, that the AI, because of it's, it's a narrow AI, that means that it works with specific data sets for specific tasks, couldn't really adapt to this more um, uh, handmade, if you will, quality of this map. Uh, so I think I will leave you with that comment. Uh, there are many things that they are like open in this discussion. Um, I, th I think I, I see a synergy here between these two, uh, the astronomer and the algorithm. But um, um, also the, the, the fact that we are using, uh, we are having like this um, new languages or new qualities that maybe have to be uh, found in these, between these synergies um, between machine and algorithms. So uh, please um, approach to the, to the map and have a look by yourself. You can also look on the tablet the small example that we, I kept for you from the, the experiment that we, we've done with the Deep Moon team. And I would be really happy to discuss with a glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you.